survivors and welcome to Survivor's Guild, the only channel that determines your odds of surviving 2014's The Taking of Deborah Logan. So stay tuned till the end for your survival stats. I'm your sharp dressed slasher turned horror host Ghostfake, and today we are documenting the memory destroying disease of one Mrs. Deborah Logan. But first, go ahead and film that like button until it notices you, and then take that subscribe button out back for a stern talking to, and then try fitting that entire share button into your mouth to let everyone know that dementia doesn't just affect the infected. It affects the whole damn family, especially if it's demonic in nature. And make sure to check out patreon.com slash survivors guild. Currently, we are sending stickers out to whoever signs up for the $1 tier and beyond. So get your survivors guild stickers at patreon.com slash survivors guild. Now I hope you like creepy old ladies who run the switchboard in the nude, in the dead of night, yelling weird things in other languages, and using different voices to do so. Cause this movie is getting spoiled. The Taking of Deborah Logan, written by Gavin Heffernan and Adam Robitel, and directed by Adam Robitel, starring Jill Larson, Anne Ramsey, Michelle Ang, Brett Gentile, Jeremy DeCarlos, and Ryan Catrona. The Taking of Deborah Logan is about a med student and her crew who set out to shoot a documentary about the degenerative brain disease Alzheimer's, only to find out that their subject may be fighting more than just Alzheimer's. We open up to text letting us know that what we are watching is a conglomeration of documentary footage, outtakes, and surveillance footage from the scene of the crime, which is another way of saying found footage, and that we are following med student Mia Hugh and her crew as they arrive in Exuma, Virginia to meet with Deborah and Sarah Logan to begin a documentary on Deborah Logan's battle with Alzheimer's. Upon pulling into the property, we get introduced to Sarah, Deborah's daughter, and of course Mia and Gavin, as well as Louise, who is the one behind the camera. We here learn that the Logans have replied to a flyer promising grant money in exchange for the crew documenting the ongoing effects of Alzheimer's on the subject, as well as the subject's family. They find Deborah in the woods behind the house with Harris, a longtime family friend. Deborah lets them know that before she agrees to it, she's not interested in being exploited or being a joke and that she only wants it to be used in an educational manner, before she ultimately decides that she doesn't want to do it. And the movie ends. So now, to find out. Just kidding. We cut to one week later, the Logans have decided to go ahead with it, and the crew returns to set up camp and begin filming their documentary. Deborah shows off her house to the crew, as well as their sleeping quarters, and showing off some of the ceramic figures that she got when she went to Germany. But things get a little awkward when Deborah doesn't remember that she's been to Germany. Were you ever in Germany? No, I have not. You went to, you went to Germany? Mia then shoots a short intro to her PhD thesis film, explaining the purpose of her documentary, and the timetable of the symptoms of Alzheimer's, which begins with proteins destroying the neurons in the part of the brain responsible for logical thought and problem solving. It then destroys the sensory regions leading to hallucinations, before it eventually erases the subject's earliest and most precious memories. And at the end stage, it takes out the subject's ability to regulate their heart, breathing, and swallowing. And quickly after that, death follows. The crew then sets up an interview with Deborah and Sarah where they explain the events leading up to the diagnosis before we get introduced to Dr. Nazir, Deborah's neurologist. We then get some of Deborah's history including the early death of her husband Dennis who died of a pulmonary embolism or a blood clot that gets stuck in the arteries of your lungs, embolisming Dennis into the meat bank at deposit number one. Hey, count them if you got them. Leading Deborah to start a successful switchboard operating service while raising Sarah as a single mother. A career wherein she learned a lot of the dirt in the town and often had to cover for affairs and alcoholics to keep her business thriving. They begin documenting her struggles intermixed with the interview audio, when finally Louise is capturing some b-roll and notices Deborah in the garden and she finds a snake, before getting jump scared by her. I'm some hungry. You hungry? And then Louise sets up cameras throughout the house while Deborah wanders around. Cut to some time later, Mia is talking with Sarah and they hear a commotion. It turns out to be Deborah yelling at Gavin, accusing him of stealing her spade. Mom, please throw it! Put that down! Put that down! which they eventually find in the freezer, exonerating Gavin. But when they go to gift her back the spade, they find Deborah staring out the window, mumbling, before she turns around and reveals that she is tearing the skin off her neck. Deborah is then hospitalized for a short time and we find out the scans have shown that the disease has advanced at an alarming rate. Cut to day 15, Deborah is released from the hospital and returns home. The crew begin noticing Deborah's odd behavior, like painting shadowy figures in the woods and talking to herself in the mirror. A few days later, the crew finds Deborah staring out the window at the yard, and Sarah lets us know that Deborah has been convinced that there is an intruder on the property. And when Sarah shuts the window, Deborah begins nailing it shut. Yep, we're nailing the windows shut 
again. Later that night, a camera catches Deborah getting out of bed, and we cut to the crew mobilizing when they realize that Deborah is missing. They find the window that she nailed shut, pried open, before they find Deborah out in the woods stabbing at the ground with her spade. They calm her down before bringing her back inside, and Mia cleans her up. Oh, he really gave us all quite a fright. Gavin then shows Mia some odd footage that he caught that night where Deborah stands in the kitchen and goes from floor to counter in a blink of an eye. Cut to day 24 when they set Deborah up for an interview wherein they show her the footage of her digging in the woods. Unfortunately, she doesn't take it very well and she attacks the crew. <laughs> Cut to some time later, the doctors are running a series of tests in an attempt to explain the anomalies of her condition. Cut to day 41, the crew arrive at Deborah's house to find Sarah and Harris holding Deborah down, trying to keep her from eating her German action figurines. And later, they find a snake in the house, prompting Gavin to get all superstitious in this his house, bringing in his Aunt Bonnie's cross to hang it up in the window. He heads into her painting room and finds a bunch of her paintings, each one more ominous than the last, before he hangs up his cross on the closed window and gets surprised by Deborah, who's been standing next to him the whole time, before the window slams open. Letting all my heat out. Later, Gavin shows Mia the footage, which she immediately tries to debunk, to which Gavin and Louise request higher compensation, or they are Audi 5000. Later, we see that Deborah has again gotten out of bed in the middle of the night, and she turns this movie into Deborah Logan after dark. The group wakes up when the landline starts ringing and they can't get the lights on. They head up to the attic as Sarah knows that it's her mom's old switchboard that is causing the phone to ring. When they get up there, they see old naked Deborah Logan manning the switchboard before she lets out a growl and begins screaming in French. <laughs> We also get a single frame of this image that is spectacularly terrifying. Yeah, that'll stick with you. Before the switchboard malfunctions and Deborah passes out, they call Dr. Nazir, who pays them a home visit and basically gives them the all clear once Deb is calmed down. The crew determined that the switch Deb was working with was 337, which Dr. Nazir says is significant and that Deb's fragile mind was probably trying to recall something. And maybe if they help her recall it, it will put her at ease. Cut to day 43, Gavin has isolated isolated the audio from that night and cleaned it up, and determined that she said something along the lines of, the eternal serpent will free you, child, and be my fifth. But Sarah says Deborah doesn't know French. And later, the crew secretly records Sarah telling Harris about this odd situation, and Harris lets her know that he wants Mia and the team gone. Later, the team dig up Deborah's old switchboard records to find out who belonged to number 337, but it is missing from her records. Louise has an idea to use charcoal to reveal the impression made by the missing record. They discover that switch 337 belonged to Henri Desjardins, a local pediatrician who was suspected of killing 14 girls in a monocan blood ritual, meaning these four girls end up in the meat bank and deposit it's two through five. They discover that this ritual required the blood of first menstruation that was offered to the demon in exchange for immortality, and that the ritual required five victims, but Henri went missing. It turns out that Henri Desjardins was dying from Lou Gehrig's disease and was trying to achieve immortality through the ritual, but something happened to him before he could finish it. Later, the group asks Deb if she remembers Henri, in which she replies that he's not missing, he's dead. Well, kinda. And that he was murdered. She runs into the bathroom and Sarah follows, and when the crew opens the door, they find that Deb has vomited up a bunch of dirt and worms. Deb is once again hospitalized and the group does some more investigation, finding out that Harris was a suspect at Henri's disappearance. Mia muses that maybe Harris dispatched Henri and Deb recovered for him, and that it took a disease to bring it to the surface. As the group considers this, they hear a gunshot and find out that a drunk Harris has come to the house and started shooting their vehicle. The cops arrive and take Harris away. The next day, Gavin decides that he's had enough and packs up his gear and leaves. Cut to day 47 and Deborah is missing from her hospital bed. Security footage shows her wandering around the hallways before she finally appears with a little girl in tow. The group eventually find her and the girl in a closed off area of the hospital, and when they retrieve the girl, they take Deborah back to her room and shackle her to her bed. Elsewhere and later, Sarah asks a priest to perform an exorcism and he politely declines. And even later and more elsewhere, the crew meet up with an anthropology professor, Dr. Schiffer, to discuss possession. He he explains that weak minds are susceptible to spiritual invasion, and he goes on to explain a situation with the Bantu tribe that he witnessed wherein a mother lost her son to typhoid into the meat bank at deposit number six, and was so overcome with grief that she took on the boy's personality and voice, almost like she was possessed, and that the only thing that freed her was a witch doctor burning the boy's body. Cut to day 60 when Harris visits Deb in the hospital and attempts, per Deb's request, 
to kill her, only for the TV to fly off the wall and knock him down. Sarah rushes in to talk to Harris before his surgery and he spills the beans to her that Deborah heard what DeHardine was going to do when operating her switchboard, and that she injured Henri when she stabbed him in the neck with her spade, before her and Harris buried him alive by the statue in her backyard. The group dig until they find Deb's spade, and Sarah comes to the conclusion that Deb dug it up first in order to preserve his body from destruction. The group heads inside to find where she put it, and are eventually led to the attic where they find a sack with DeHardine's remains. They take the remains downstairs to burn it in the fireplace, and when they light it on fire, something puts out the fire and throws them back across the room. <laughs> The group run outside onto the porch before seeing a figure in the window looking at them, causing them to flee from the home. When they stop and regroup, Sarah gets a call telling her that Deborah has escaped her hospital bed again. Sarah runs back into the house to retrieve the remains and the group head to the hospital. We see security footage of a guard stopping Deb and her new friend, but Deb bites him on the neck, apparently poisoning him with venom, but not necessarily killing him. Sarah calls Sheriff Tweed and the group head to the Monacan Mill. They find Deb and Kara and carefully approach them, and when Sheriff Tweed tries to put handcuffs on her. Deb begins spitting venom at them before running off into the night. Louise leaves with the officer, taking him back down the mountain for medical intervention, while Sarah, Mia, and Sheriff Tweed search for Deborah and Kara. They are led to an old abandoned mill, and Sheriff Tweed heads in while they wait outside. They hear a gunshot, and the window explodes near them, so they head inside, only to find that Sheriff Tweed is laying lifeless in the meat bank at deposit number 7. Sarah and Mia head into the mines to find Deb and Kara, avoiding the snakes that Deborah has left in her wake. After some searching, they find Deborah with her jaw unhinged like a snake, attempting to devour Kara. Sarah fires her gun, which causes Deb to regurgitate Kara and retreat. Fight him, Mom! Fight him! Fight him! Sarah is then able to stab Deb in the neck with a sedative, and they then burn Dehardine's remains. And with Deborah apparently free from Dehardine, Sarah goes to comfort her. Cut to some time later in a news report, where we find out that Deborah has been determined to be medically unfit for trial for the murder of Sheriff Tweed, and that Kara is in full remission. Oh, cool! It's one of those happy endings. Maybe. You better make a plan. I have one. What is it? It's a secret. But during the news report, we find out that there might be something more behind Kara's remission, and the movie ends. So now, to find out, what are your chances of suffering survivor's guilt? This is where we take a look at our main characters and the death that surrounds them to determine your odds of surviving this movie. And today's stats are brought to you by good friend of the channel, Rainbow Fright. <laughs> oh, it's my turn. Let's talk meat bank deposits. My favorite. We start off our meat bank deposit with poor little old Dennis, Deborah's husband. We find out that he died years prior, leaving Deborah and Sarah all alone. After that is the discovery of the ancient Monacan blood ritual carried out by Henri Desjardins, which left four girls dead covered in their own blood. They also had cute little carvings on their forehead and snake venom in their blood. They must have tasted real good too because bits of their flesh had been eaten making them meat bank deposits two, three, four, and five. The Bantu boy comes in at meat bank deposit number six. His mother wasn't able to move past his death, so she soon became possessed by him. The spell was finally broken by a witch doctor who burnt his body to a crunchy crisp. And we wrap up our meat bank deposits with Sheriff Linda Tweed, Sarah's lover. She meets her demise with a single gunshot. She also must have tasted pretty good, because she was found with the serpent sucking the blood out of her lifeless body. Mmm. Mmm. Now let's take a look at our survivors. Despite her degenerative disease, Deborah makes it to the end, along with Sarah, Mia, Louise, Gavin, Harris, Dr. Nazir, and Dr. Dehardin. Which means that out of a total of 16 characters, only 9 survive, giving you a 56.25% chance of surviving this movie. Given those odds, will you be the next one to get one of those beautiful little carvings on your forehead? Let me know in the comments below. Bye! <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
And thank you so much to Rainbow Fright for delivering today's stats. Survivors, go ahead and go check out Rainbow Fright's channel for some fantastic horror movie reviews. And a huge thanks to all my patrons, Chris D, Sackhead Ed, Bubba T, Max H, Video Creep, Papi Ulio, Valentina P, Mintrix, Brady D, Matthew, Vids for You, Mr. Nightmare Fuel, Maxwell the Kaiju Man, Lobotomite, and Whiskey. And for those of you who don't know, we have two tiers on Patreon. One for $1 a month, wherein you get stickers, early access to episodes of Survivor's Guild, and special Patreon-only content. And we also have another tier called the True Believer, in which each month you are entered in to win a ghost fake mask. So if you're interested in those things, go ahead and check out patreon.com slash Survivor's Guild. Alrighty guys, as always, thanks, and don't die. Now let's take a look at our survivors. We've got Deborah, Sarah, Mia. Oh, dude, I didn't even finish it. This sucks. <laughs>